Good evening. Oh, Kenny, I'm sorry I made you cry. Uh, welcome. We're glad to see everybody here who's here and anybody who may be watching on our YouTube channel, welcome to you as well. Uh, it's always great to pause from the week to uh, forget all the stuff that we've contended with the past couple of days and focus in on the weekend. Today we're on the hump and it's all downhill from here. Uh, to begin our, our service tonight, song number 615. 615. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee. Peace be still. In all of life's ebb and flow. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Sweetest name I know Fills my every longing Keeps me singing as I go Feasting on the riches of His grace Resting neath His sheltering wing Always looking on his smiling face, that is why I shout and sing. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Soon he's coming back to welcome me Far beyond the starry sky I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown I shall live with him on high Jesus, Jesus, Jesus Sweetest name I know Fills my every longing Keeps me singing as I go There's somebody, okay. We now have our prayer. Would you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for this time that we are about to um, spend together worshiping you, learning about you, and listening to your word. I pray that you um, open our ears, open our hearts, and bless us during this time, and help us to <clears throat> think critically about what we're doing here, and what you would have us do with our lives. We thank you for making this possible. We thank you for the encouragement that we get from each other and the, <clears throat> the songs that we sing to you, the <clears throat> joy that we get just from being here. We pray for those who are unable to be here tonight whether it's <clears throat> um, sickness of the body, sickness of the spirit, um, whether they're traveling, or they're just away for some other reason, I pray that you be with them and bring, us, bring them back to us. And we thank you for those who are here. <clears throat> uh, online, that even though that they can't be with us in, in body, that they're here with us in, in some fashion. I pray that you bless them, bless, bless their evening, and help them to get something out of this as well. We thank you for all that you do for us. 
Thank you for the warming weather. Thank you for spring being right around the corner. <clears throat> Pray that you take care of us, continue watching over us, and help us to keep our eyes on you. Always do, um, always do what we know we're supposed to do. Stay in your word and be obedient to your will. We thank you for giving us Jesus. We thank you for the salvation <clears throat> that we have through him, and the eternal life that we have through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Song number 722. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. All in wonderful passion and Song number 613. Good evening, everybody. As we get started with our Devo tonight, I want to read 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, and I want us to keep these in mind as we go over a story. It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. On May 7th, 2017, at the Buffalo Circus in northern France, there is a man by the name of Steve Lobero who was doing a routine with his lion. And wouldn't you know it, the lion bit him. Right? Not surprising because after all, lions are not exactly safe. They're predators with sharp claws, sharp teeth. They're not fluffy little kittens. And even if you raise them in captivity, they're still wild, <coughs> deadly, dangerous, and they work on instinct. They don't reason to themselves like humans and say, I probably shouldn't eat my trainer because he's been very nice to me for many years. They just act. And yet, many zoos and other habitat places keep all manner of dangerous animals like lions and tigers and bears and all sorts of things. <laughs> exactly. Now I ask the question, why? Why do we do this? A couple of reasons come to mind. Number one, they're cute. We love looking at them. So we think we should keep them, especially as pets. 
Number two, we want to preserve them. We want to make sure that they can continue on and don't go extinct and that we can study them for research purposes. And number three, we think we can control them. We think that if we just raise them correctly and treat them well, we can tame their instincts and they won't hurt us. But ask Siegfried and Roy how that went. Ask Grizzly Man how that went, who was eaten by bears. Now, if we can't even train our house cats to not scratch and attack us, what are we thinking that we can tame lions? I think it's a good question for us because just as nature intended, as Steve was doing his routine, the lion pounced on him, bit him, dragged him around the cage he was in, and tried killing him. The only reason he survived is because someone else brought a fire extinguisher into the cage and got the lion off. It took several hours of surgeries just to get Steve into a stable condition. And at the end of it all, he said, I'm going to go back and do my routine again once I get better. Now, here is the main takeaway from this event. Somebody took a video to show exactly what was going on. Steve was separated from the crowd by a large enclosed metal cage because lions are dangerous, and he knew it. He knew there had to be a cage. He wasn't wearing protection because he thought he could handle it because he had been around this lion an awful lot. And then, of course, there's the people on the outside who were screaming in terror, running away, because that's an appropriate response to a lion attack. And then again, there's Steve who says, I will go back and do this again. So what does this have to do with us? And what does this have to do with the Bible? Well, as Peter says, there is an adversary roaming around like a lion trying to devour us. Over and over again, the Bible warns us that sin is dangerous. It got us kicked out of the garden. It got the world flooded. It destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. It got Israel taken to captivity. And we learn in the New Testament that if we continue in sin, we will not inherit the kingdom of God. And yet, despite this, there are many Christians who act like lion tamers. We know sin is dangerous, so we put up these big metaphorical cages between people in sin, and we say, don't do it, it's not worth it, it's dangerous, don't go in there. And yet, how often do we find ourselves in the cage with no protection because we think we can handle it? Somehow we get it in our mind that sin can be tamed and it won't hurt us because we're professionals, but it'll hurt other people so they can't do it. And then even when it bites us, we're like, well, it wasn't that bad, so I'll go in there again and do it again. We do struggle with this, but like lions, sin cannot be tamed to where it is no longer dangerous. And the Bible explains this in various ways. We can think of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, that says, let us take heed lest we fall. We can think of passages like Proverbs chapter 6, verses 23 through 29, that talks about, can a man carry fire in his bosom and not get burned? Can he walk on coals and his feet not be singed? Or what about passages like Proverbs 16, 18? that tell us pride goes before destruction and haughty eyes before a fall, thinking that we can handle these sins that other people can't. Now, what's the remedy? Well, Peter gives it to us here in 1 Peter 5. He says, be sober. Always keep your mind clear. Understand that it's our desires that lead us astray. So we need to know what our desires are and where they interact with sin. And we need to not do anything to our minds to put us in a state where we are going to let our guard down. In other words, don't get in the cage in the first place. Then he tells us to be vigilant and he says, be on the lookout for lions because they're dangerous. Be on the lookout for sin, which means know what tempts us. 
know what could tempt us, and know when we are most likely tempted. Maybe it's when you're tired. Maybe it's when you're angry. Maybe it's when you're distracted. Maybe that's the time when sin is more likely to get a hold of you. And then he says, resist. So not only are we supposed to be on the lookout for it, but we need to have a plan in place for when those temptations come, we need to know in advance how we will react, and we need to fight those temptations with faith, with scripture, and help from our brothers and sisters. And finally, have a proper reaction plan. When sin bites you, because it will, it will bite all of us from time to time, don't just say God is love and he'll forgive me and get back in the cage. Realize that sin is horrifying. It is dangerous. And the proper response is to flee. Tonight, if you're not a Christian, the lions already have you. You are prey. You are dead in your trespasses. But you can submit your life to the God who shuts the mouths of the lions. And you can live a new life free of temptations and with a family who can help you with that. And if you're a Christian tonight, if you're struggling with sin, if you've been bitten by sin, if you're in the cage with it right now and you need to get out, or even if you have already felt that sting and you're getting ready to get back in, I think it's time we make that change. Follow God and come back home to him. Tonight, if you have a need, we'd be happy to assist you if you come while we stand and while we sing. Time and filled with swift transition. Especially, I like the part with lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. <laughs> Did you realize you said that? <laughs> uh, an update here on Mary. Uh, they're uh, asking for us to continue to pray for her and the family. Um, looks like there's some long-term plans that have been made. She's in a recovery facility for at least another week, and the doctors seem pleased with her progress. And in the, in the next week, they'll determine what kind of consistency of food she can tolerate. So there's some progress there, so that's good news. So keep those prayers coming. And also, uh, you can see more complete update in the, in the email and, and uh, the announcements that go out. Let's see. Kimberly's friend 
friend's cousin passed away. Yeah. Continue to pray for their family. Uh, it says, just a reminder, we have many who are ill and having struggles. Uh, many of the sick have recovered. Uh, but, uh, again, there's... The... Yes, Danny. Remember, you're on TV. Yeah, Kim had asked uh, if she did yeah. the prayers for the church. She is just sick of being sick. In case you didn't hear that, Kim is sick of being sick. It seems like the last few months it's been just one thing after another. And uh, asking for our prayers. Uh, again, all this, all the crud's going around. Everybody's getting it. The kids are getting it. They're bringing it home. We're getting it. It just, it's that time of year. So, uh, let's see. Let's see. Great news in the news department. Good news department. There's a note here from Darlene Chamberlain uh, that the home where Alan uh, lives, ends their quarantine policies Friday, so Alan will be with us Sunday. Excellent. There's a couple events the next two weeks. Uh, on the 16th, uh, the Wednesday uh, night cafe. It looks like Wendy's bringing chili and cornbread, extra on the cornbread. Uh, what, Dave? <laughs> Did I do something bad? Just really quick. Both the parents today, she, uh, she's going in for a procedure on Friday. She just asked uh, to pray for her please and she just wants to say she loves everybody and she misses everybody will you please send that to me in a text i will because i'll forget it otherwise yeah. okay okay singles meet at the campbells at 7 p.m friday right and there's a ladies brunch on february 26th uh at 10 a.m in the fellowship hall so that's the highlights that I have. Again, if you have announcements, get them to Kathy so we can get them posted and shared with everybody. Uh, we're going to uh, have a, I guess, Jerry's going to lead us in a verse so that the teachers can prepare for the classes, and we'll continue then with the adult Bible class. Thanks. First verse, song number 716. Sing to me of heaven, sing that song of peace. Found the door that by me will bring release. Burden will be lifted at our pressing so Now is all great blessing on my heart. All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome into our Joshua class this Wednesday. If you were with us last Wednesday, we finished chapter three. We'll do a little bit of reading in there tonight, but we will be primarily in Joshua chapter four. But as always, let's get started with a prayer. Our Father in heaven, we love you so much. We thank you that you are love, that you are justice, that you are mercy, and that you have all the qualities we need to have a loving relationship with our God, with our Savior. 
We thank you that you saw it fit to create us, to love us, and to save us, and that you've offered salvation for all people. We thank you for those who have chosen it, and we pray for us as we continue to spread that message. We pray for effectiveness as we try to bring others into your kingdom, that we can follow your commands to be strong and courageous and to not be afraid. We thank you for your word, and we thank you for all the stories inside of it that demonstrate your character, prove who you are, and help us to understand that we can fully trust you to always follow through on your word. We thank you for the book of Joshua tonight that we'll be studying, and we thank you for the memorials we'll discuss and how those can impact our lives even today to better understand who you are and to better understand our mission. We praise you and we thank you for all the blessings that you've given us. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So here in Joshua chapter 3, just by way of review, we will read starting in verse 9. It says, So Joshua said to the children of Israel, Come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, By this you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Hivites and the Perizzites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Jebusites. Behold, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over before you into the Jordan. Now therefore take for yourselves twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one man from every tribe. And it shall come to pass, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the Ark of the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, the waters that come down from upstream, and they shall stand up as a heap. So we talked about the crossing of the Jordan last week. We talked about how important of an event this was and how miraculous this was because of the state of this river and because of the power of God. And we mentioned that God was doing this for a reason, because he wanted them to understand, I will be with you. And in the text there, it also says, I'm doing this, I'm cutting off this river, so you will know for certain that I will be the one to drive out all of your enemies from the land. So it's important to keep that in mind as we especially get into chapter 4, where we are talking about the crossing being ended and the final capstone that's on top of that. So one thing we read there in verse number 12, but we didn't really discuss last week, is that Joshua commanded to have 12 people, 12 men, get themselves ready. For those of you who have read chapter 4 or who have been studying ahead, what are these men going to do? Collect rocks. Collect rocks. Okay. For what purpose? For a memorial, right? So we'll get into that as we start reading here in chapter 4. We want to keep that in mind. And it came to pass. When all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take for yourselves twelve men from the people, one man from every tribe, and command them, saying, Take for yourselves twelve stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet stood firm, you shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. Why? Why would they do such a thing? We understand it's for a memorial, but why this? Because God told them. Okay, because God told them to. That's good enough reason, right? God says, we're going to take some stones, and we're going to make this happen. Now, he says we're going to take 12 men. Why 12? Tribes. Representative of the tribes. Representative of all the tribes. And that's interesting, because how many tribes are going to be in the land? 
Yeah, around that, right? There's two and a half who's on the other side of the Jordan. So we'd ask, like, why wouldn't God say, well, let, let's take, you know, the nine and a half tribes. Each of you get a stone. He told all twelve. What's significant about that? So Israel is one people. Mm -hmm. And the memorial is for all the people. Yeah. Yeah, the memorial is for all the people. Because remember, those men from the two and a half tribes, they came over because they were going to fight for their brothers and their land. They were going to help. And I just bring that up because later on toward the very end of Joshua, we're going to see that those two and a half tribes on the eastern side had an idea that they might be forgotten. And this is something already in advance that they are showing that they are unified. God says that even though your inheritance isn't on this side of the land, you are still included and I am still your God. So very important to keep that in mind. Uh, we also have the location of where these stones were to come from, right? So it says in the midst or in the middle of the water, what's significant about taking these rocks from the middle? Well, it says specifically where the priest's feet stood firmly. Yes. Right? So these were rocks that were not only in the presence of the priests, but also in God's presence. Yes. Because that's where the ark also was. Yeah. And remember, that's where they were standing so everybody could cross. It is a marker specifically of, do you remember when God stood in the middle of the river? and when he caused that river to basically shut off. So it's not just some rocks that were on the bank that they're carrying over. These were special rocks, right? And I think another thing that's interesting about this is, what do you know about rocks that are in water? They're usually smooth, right? How would that compare to the deserts that the Israelites had been in, or even where they're crossing, where there's a lot of mountains and crags and jagged rocks and all of that. Wow. Right? It's interesting because if you come across a pile of smooth rocks out in the desert like that, you're going to go, hmm, I wonder what that's about. Because it doesn't look like the rocks that are around me. And it gives pause, it gives them the ability to ask a question because I'm sure there's lots of rocks out there and this was intended to be a memorial and one other thing is that if it's in the middle that's typically where the deeper parts are right because you have the banks and then you kind of go inward and it tends to get deep it really shows God's power to take these rocks from a place people really weren't able to go so God is definitely using some stones here for a very important reason. And then notice how Joshua complies with this in ch chapter 4, verse 4. It says, Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the tribe of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Now notice, where are they carrying these rocks? On their shoulder. On their shoulder. What does that tell us? They're large. They're big rocks, right? Big rocks make a statement. We're not talking about pebbles. We're not talking about something you could carry in your hand like a pet rock, you know. This is something that is significant. It's going to be very noticeable. And God says the purpose is so people will ask questions. And that's going to be important because what did this generation not get to see? Promised land. Well, they were going to see the promised land. They got to see the Jordan cut off. What didn't they see? They didn't see the plagues of Egypt. They didn't see the miracles in the desert. Yeah, they didn't see the plagues. They didn't see the crossing of the Red Sea. Was it still important for them to know about that? Yeah. Yes. 
What about future generations who didn't cross over the Jordan? Would it be important for them to know about this story? Yes. yes. Right? These things are for our learning, our Romans 15, 4 would say. But he says in verse 6, they're going to ask, what do these stones mean? And then in verse 7, then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord when it crossed over the Jordan. And the waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial for the children of Israel forever. And the children of Israel did so just as Joshua commanded, and took up twelve stones from the midst of the Jordan, as the Lord had spoken to Joshua, according to the number of the tribes of Israel, and carried them over with them to the place where they lodged, and they laid them down there. So, this is going to be something to keep in mind, but this is a place where they're camping. And that's going to be significant because they're not going to stay here forever. Right? Eventually, this land is going to be swallowed up by one of the tribes. I believe Joshua 18, around verse 21, would indicate most likely Benjamin would have this land. So people wouldn't necessarily come across this memorial every day the same way they would celebrate Passover every year, but it was still important to have these reminders because they pointed out facts. And this is one of the things the world tries to take away from us and tries to make us feel bad about. They say, well, these things didn't actually happen. They didn't really part the Red Sea and walk across on dry land. God didn't really give plagues in Egypt. They didn't really stop the Jordan. Those are just myths. Those are just stories. But when you have those rocks from the middle of the Jordan on the side of the bank, and you can see them, what does that do for your faith? It strengthens it, right? It gives you some sort of proof. And we talk about this all the time, especially as New Testament Christians. I don't think any of us are quite old enough to have been around when Jesus was crucified. But how can we trust that that happened? We have firsthand witnesses who wrote about it. We had people who lived with Jesus, who were around him. Even John in 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, talks about how they touched him, and they heard him. They were with him. And, you know, for any of you who have done investigating or things like that, you know, firsthand eyewitness statements are important. But also there were some secular historians who had made reference to this. Yes, there are also secular historians who made reference to it. And just like with that, in this, we know that they crossed over the water. We know that they left Egypt. We know that they were in the wilderness. We know that they were in the promised land. All of those things are true. So then you're left with the question of how did they do that? And God says, well, here are some stones to show how I did that. And those stones are also a reminder for these people if God can stop the Jordan, what else can he do? Anything he wants to. Anything he wants. <laughs> now, how's that going to make you feel when your first city to conquer is the giant walled city of Jericho? It would help me, right, to know that God could stop the Jordan and he can take care of this city. So this memorial is going to be important for us. And then notice what Joshua does here in verse number 9. It says, Then Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of the Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant stood, and they are there to this day. So not only did they take stones out of the water and put them on the side where they were camping, they also put stones where the priest stood to mark it. And I don't know exactly when this book was written and when this author is penning this, but he says the stones are still there. 
And even if the stones aren't there today, they were there back then, and they knew where they were, and they could go back and see those things, which was very important. So it's a great message for us. As we get a little bit further into the text, start around verse number 10, it says, So the priests who bore the ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord had commanded Joshua to speak to the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua. And the people hurried and crossed over. Then it came to pass, when all the people had completely crossed over, that the ark of the Lord and the priests crossed over in the presence of the people. What do we take from that? I think there is a very important lesson we can learn. If you follow God, you go the right path. All right. If you follow God, you're definitely going to go the right path. What else do we see? Let me ask this question. Who was the first one in the water? Priests. Priests and God. Who was the last one in the water? The priests and God. The priests and God. What does that tell us? Guess who held the water back. What was that? Guess who held the water back. Guess who held the water back. Right. But also, it's that idea that God is going in front of you. God is also behind you. He is completely surrounding us. He is taking care of us. Because notice, when did the water stop flowing? As soon as the priest's feet hit the banks, right? Now, what if the priest just decided to walk to the other side, you know, halfway through the crossing? Hmm. That water's coming back, right? Because as soon as they get out of there, the water comes back. So God is waiting for all his people to go safely through. And that really gets to the heart of the idea of like God being our shepherd and us being sheep and Jesus being the good shepherd and the door of the sheep and how he leads us out and he takes us back in and he takes care of us. You know, we don't just follow God. He's also with us the entire way. And that's important because he didn't let a single one of these people down. He waited until everybody crossed and then they had the water come back. And then in verse 12, it says, The men of Reuben, the men of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh crossed over armed before the children of Israel, as Moses had spoken to them. About 40,000 prepared for war, crossed over before the Lord for battle to the plains of Jericho. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they feared him as they had feared Moses all the days of his life. Now, what does that connect us back to? The previous chapter. Okay. When God said, one of the things that I'm doing here is establishing you as my leader. Yeah. And God says in chapter 2, Joshua, this day I'm going to exalt you as the leader. Notice, God exalted him as leader. You're going to see that all throughout the book of Joshua. God says something, it happens. God says something, it happens. There's a reason for this repetition, because God wants us to be able to trust him. So he definitely does that, and then he is, as the leader, he is feared, and they obey him, and what's really good is that they actually do it a lot better than they did for Moses, right? Because how often did they disobey Moses and cause him grief? Yeah, this is a new generation. So. Yeah, yeah. The old generation acted one way, the new generation's acting a very different way. And what we read is that Israel was faithful all the days of Joshua and the elders who outlived Joshua. And then we get the book of Judges, which is a little bit different. 
but at least for the time of Joshua, they were faithful. So they, they kept to this, and a lot of it had to do with God exalting him through this way. And that's where we go back to this idea that God could have had them cross over anywhere. He could have brought them into the land any way he saw fit, but he chose to do it this way for a reason. And we have to be able to respect that. Any questions, concerns, comments so far? All right, let's get started in verse 14 there. So on that day, he exalted Joshua. They feared him. And then verse 15, the Lord spoke to Joshua saying, command the priests who bear the ark of the testimony to come up from the Jordan. Joshua therefore commanded the priest saying, come up from the Jordan. And it came to pass when the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord had come from the midst of the Jordan, and the soles of the priest's feet touched the dry land, that the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed its banks as before. So God really intervened, and notice when they're camping at Gilgal that God didn't just have them cross from bank to bank. He had to take them in far enough where they would be safe from the water because it was overflowing the banks. So he needed to make sure to get them to safety. And again, we see this is instantaneous, unlike when God sent that wind all night to part the Red Sea in the book of Exodus. So it's a little bit different. Some would say even more miraculous than the Exodus crossing. But now the water is coming back and in verse 19, we get a very interesting piece of information uh, that we want to see. It says, Now the people came up from the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month, and they camped in Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. What is significant about this? And it's okay if we don't know. I mean, Gilgal's going to be where that stone monument was. Okay, Gilgal's where the stone monument was. Right. What about the date? Have we heard this date before? And I know, believe me, it's very hard to keep all of these dates mentioned in the Bible straight. Well, let's turn over to the book of Exodus. And specifically, let's go to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12, let's start here in verse number 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth month of this month, or on the, t of the tenth day of this month, Every man shall take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father, a lamb for his household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him take his neighbor next to his house and take it according to the number of the persons, each according to each man's need. You shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. And then it goes in. What was the purpose of that? Yes, so that, that is the last plague where the destroyer goes through and he takes all the firstborn of Egypt out and any of the firstborn of people who didn't put the blood on their doors. And notice, when did they start getting ready for that? The tenth day of the first month. 
What day did they cross over the Jordan? The tenth day of the first month. Why? What's significant about this? Because God, again, could have chosen any way to bring them into the land. He also could have chosen any day. He spent 40 years in the wilderness. Another day or two wouldn't have hurt, but he brought them over on this day after separating them and making them holy. It's what? It's Passover. It's Passover, right? He's making a statement here because this kind of closes the loop on the Exodus story, right? They hadn't left Egypt yet. So God says on the 10th day, you're going to get your lambs ready. On the 14th day, we're going to slaughter. And then we're going to leave Egypt. From Egypt, they get into the wilderness and they go to Mount Horeb. And then they're walking around the wilderness for 40 years. And wouldn't you know it, that the day they enter into the promised land, that was their inheritance that God said, I'm giving to you hundreds of years ago, it's that same day to prepare. The same day to get ready. One marks the exit from their exodus. The other marks their freedom from slavery and the inheritance of their promise. And their first action that they get to do in the promised land is to celebrate. I find that amazing because oftentimes when we think of memorials, especially something like the Lord's Supper, we're sad. And then rightly so, we should be sad that Jesus had to die, but we should also be very happy that he did. We should be thrilled at what that means for us, because now we have the chance for salvation. And if we didn't have Jesus die, we would be dead in our sins. So their first act is they get to celebrate with their God the inheritance of their promise and what does Gilgal mean? Because it specifically mentions that they are in Gilgal and probably have some notes in your Bible. And even in the text, it gives us a little bit of a hint. We don't see it in there. Gilgal means rolled away. And God is specifically saying, I'm rolling away your reproach. What kind of reproach did they have? <coughs> or what did they need to come out of, let's say? It's a toughie. Where did they come from? God would describe it as an iron furnace. In Egypt, right? They have gone from slaves. Well, actually, let me back it up even further. Abraham was a nomad who didn't get to inherit the promise he was given. Didn't even have land of his own. He gave birth to people who didn't inherit the promise, who gave birth to people who became great in a land that wasn't going to be theirs in Egypt. And then, after a period of time when a new pharaoh arose who didn't know of Joseph, they were subjected to slavery. They were horribly mistreated. Their babies were set to be killed. They were, you know... OSHA violations for work, <laughs> to put it mildly, right? And God says, I'm taking you from being a slave to walking in this wilderness to being free. This was their freedom. It's the same freedom we get when we're wandering in sin, and then we become Christians and we are now free. Uh, now, I will say that we're actually slaves on either side. You get to be a slave of God, or you get to be a slave of sin, but you get to pick the master, which is nice. So God is having them celebrate 
their transition from slaves without a home to free men with a home, inheriting the promise that he gave them. And that's why Gilgal means rolled away, because God is taking away the reproach of them being a small group of people in slavery to being a group of free people in a new land that is just for them, prepared for, by their God. So he says there in verse 19, they come in on the 10th day, they're on the east border of Jericho, and those 12 stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up in Gilgal. Then he spoke to the children of Israel, saying, when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, what are these stones? Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel crossed over the Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had crossed over. That all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, and that you may fear the Lord your God forever. So we have kind of the conclusion to the crossing here, and Joshua ends it with basically three points of why God is doing this. What are they? As the memorial for the future generation. Okay, and what are we teaching? I mean, of course we're teaching them that we went over the Jordan on dry land, but in that very last verse of the chapter, God is kind of reiterating why he did this. To know that God is mighty. Yeah. So, I mean, number one, know that there's a God in Israel. Know that they have a God. Number two, like Wes said, know they or know that their God is mighty. If anything can show his might, it would be stopping the river and crossing the sea. And then also, what's the third thing? God is forever. God is forever. And, and we should do what because of that? We should fear him. We should fear him. Now, is he talking about the people of the land, or is he talking to Israel? they too would reference God as well. Yeah, so in reality, he's talking to both, but specifically, he's speaking to Israel. He's saying that you need to fear him. That's a big thing. They need to know there's a God in Israel. They need to know that he is mighty. They need to know that they should fear him. How many of those things have changed? Have any of them changed? I mean, we know from Galatians chapter 6 that the church is the Israel of God, right? We're still his people. He's still our God. Is the Lord still mighty? Yeah. Yeah. Should we still fear him? Yeah. So what does this memorial mean to us? What should it do for us? It should remind us. It should give us confidence it should instill fear in us of our God. And I think we have trouble with that sometimes, right? We look at this as if it happened so long ago that it doesn't quite apply. It's even under a different covenant. So it's hard to put yourself in the shoes of these people who crossed over the Jordan, but this story, this memorial is meant for us just as much as it was meant for them so that way, notice, we're still talking about this. We're still going over this event. We're still learning lessons from it. And as true as it was back then with those stones still in the water and still in Gilgal when this was written, those facts are still the same for us. So we may be separated by time and by location and other things, but what we want to understand is that we have a God who is still mighty, still deserves to be feared, and we have to be okay with that. 
And we have to use that because our God is powerful and he is on our side. You know, I think of it sometimes like, you know, we've been blessed if you're a New England Patriots fan that over the past 20 years, they've been really good, right? They've won lots of championships. Everything was great. Nice time to be alive. If you were alive in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and the early 90s, how was that? Right? And will they be good forever? No. So when I'm old and crotchety and they're, you know, 1 in 15 or 1 in 16 every year because they're not doing well, I can look back on the glory days and say, you know, when I was young, they were really good. And sometimes I think we do that with God. It's like, yeah, way back then he did all those miracles and he was so powerful. And today eh, we don't really see those. So it's sometimes hard to feel connected to God the same way. But the God who crossed the sea, who split it, the God who stopped the Jordan, he's our God. His power has not changed. It has not lessened. And if we use that and keep that in mind, who knows what good we can actually accomplish because he's still on our side. Well, you know, if you look at the totality of the circumstances of, of the Old Testament, mm -hmm. you know, instead of just isolating on this crossing of joy, let's go back to creation. Yeah. Okay, and, and, and from the time that God created man, pronounced it be very good, Everything that God has ever said from that point on is going to happen, happen, and, and what he said he was going to do, he did. Yeah. So, you know, you have all the promises to Abraham, and then to Isaac, and then to Jacob, and, and the, the prophecy that his people will be in captivity, but he was going to punish the people that held him in captivity for yeah. 100 years. And we see that the fulfillment of that promise with Moses and with now you have the crossing of the Red Sea, you have uh, the miracles he performed in the desert. I mean, we can look back on that. Yes. And, and, and see, yeah, it's the same God that did all this stuff. It's the same God who we worship, who has graciously adopted us into his family through his son, Christ Jesus. That's right. So it's... Uh, and, and Paul made a very good point of saying that all the stuff that happened was through our example, for our instruction, for yeah. to know who it is that our faith is not just blind faith, but it's a reasonable faith. It's a yeah. solid faith. And, right. it's, and it's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Yeah. All the proof he offered them is the same proof that we have. All the confidence they could have is the confidence that we have. And all the fear they should have had is the fear that we should have. And if we fear God like they did, we're going to watch in this book how they conquer the promised land. We can do the same thing to the spiritual landscape around here. Because we have the same God with the same power, and he's going to be with us because he promised it. And he promised that whenever his word goes out, it will come back fruitful. So we just need to make sure we trust in that. So that kind of wraps it up for chapter 4. We'll get into chapter 5 next week, talking about the circumcision of the second generation there's a lot of good things to dive into there. But what other questions, comments do we have as we wrap up tonight? Um, I was just thinking that I was listening to a, um, somebody speak. I don't remember exactly the, uh, I can't remember the name of the guy, but he talks about the reliability of the Bible. Mm -hmm. and, um, the proof is really out there if you if you look for it. Like you, oh, yeah. you can find um, there are people out there that have uh, well, people a lot smarter than I am that have found ways of making you know of proving that these things actually happen. You know, yeah. um, and so for me, I think that's pretty cool to, to study those things, and so that you know it's not blind faith. Yeah, and we get to watch all the promises get fulfilled, which is nice, because they were still waiting on some of this. God says, I'll drive all the people out, but that hadn't happened yet. So they're still in the middle. And then by the time we get to Joshua 21, Joshua would say that every good word that the Lord had spoken had come to pass, and not a single thing failed. And we get to see that not only in Joshua, but as Jerry was saying, all throughout the Bible. 
And you know, we understand this is the same word that they were using way back, you know, around the, the thousand BC time period. They have these copies, and we can trust the Bible. And because of that, we're, we're in good shape. Eric? Just a footnote, you kind of mentioned it, but the Jordan River was actually at flood stage when they crossed. Mm -hmm. And that in itself was sort of defined the miracle because yeah. any other during the dry season. In some places, the Jordan River is only three feet deep, so right. they could have said, ah, you know, it wasn't a big deal, they just walked across, right, three feet, but during flood stage, it's so turbulent, so violent, yeah. you are not crossing the Jordan. That's right. And, and uh, its depth increases uh, substantially in some areas to 50 feet, so yeah. you know, without God intervening there, they weren't going to cross at that time of year. Oh yeah, with, with all that, plus all the mud and the sediment and everything, trying to get a million plus people across with their animals and their goods, not going to happen. Some have speculated, this is speculation, that it took them 11, up to 11 days to get across it with that many people. I don't know if that has any merit or not, but that's just, you know, they, they didn't do it in an hour, put it that way. At least in the text it says they hurried. <laughs> it doesn't give us the time frame. But th those priests were certainly standing there the whole time oh, until they did cross it. They were, yeah, it, it, you know, a million people were going to cross it. Yeah. Minutes. yeah, and that's where we brought up last week as well. The place where it was cut off was a, somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 30 miles away. So it did give them quite a gap to cross, but that's still a lot of people. Lot of people. So, you know, it, it was a huge event. And then imagine wash, watching all that water come rushing back. You know, that's a river that's been cut off and spot. heaped up. Yeah, make your hair stand up on your arm. Yeah, yeah. And that might even be more effective at showing how powerful God is to watch him stop that and then watch it come back. So a lot of good things here in Joshua 4. Keep in mind, we have memorials too. We have these, we have the Lord's Supper, we've got his word. Keep these things fresh in our minds because they're all still true, they're all still valuable, and we still serve the same God. I think that will do it for tonight, so I thank you for your time and attention, and we will get started in Chapter 5 next week.